In this video, I'm going to talk about Johnson Nyquist noise, which is the source of a lot of the noise that you often find in electronic systems. So it may surprise you to hear that if you took a resistor and connect one terminal of that resistor to ground and measure the voltage on the other terminal here, that the voltage you measure at any given time will typically not be equal to zero despite the fact that this resistor is tying that wire to ground. So how is it that we can have a voltage across this resistor when we haven't even connected anything to it? To answer that, we'll begin with Ohm's law, which says that voltage is equal to current times resistance. And obviously this resistor has a resistance R. So if we're measuring a voltage here, that must mean that there's a current that we don't know about. So let me try to draw this resistor from the side now. So let's pretend that this is our resistor R and we're measuring the voltage between the lead over here and the lead over here. Now at any given time, there are a bunch of electrons inside of this resistor associated with the conductor that connects the two terminals. And these electrons aren't stationary. At any given time, they're bouncing in some random direction around inside of this resistor. So these electrons are moving. And their velocity depends on the temperature of this resistor. And a typical velocity for one of these electrons would be where the kinetic energy of their motion, one half mv squared, is of order the characteristic energy that corresponds to a given temperature, which is Boltzmann's constant K times the temperature of that resistor in Kelvin, which is to say that V is of order the square root of 2 kT over the mass of the electron. Now, if you're curious just how fast that is, for a typical room temperature of 300 Kelvin, using the Boltzmann's constant in CGS units is 1.4 times 10 to the minus 16, and the mass of the electron is of order 1 times 10 to the minus 27 grams, you get a velocity that's of order 1 times 10 to the 7th centimeters per second, which is to say about 0.03% of the speed of light. So these electrons are moving really fast. Now the other key, recognize that these electrons are moving, is that they're moving in random directions. And this is because they're bouncing and colliding with one another many, many times. So in essence, each velocity of each electron is some random number whose magnitude is given by the temperature of the resistor and whose orientation is totally random. Now the central limit theorem tells us that if we add up n random numbers, then the magnitude of that sum grows as the square root of the number of numbers we add together. Now the consequence for Johnson noise is that when we add up all the random velocities of all of these electrons, it doesn't add up to zero. It adds up to a net velocity. So the consequence of the central limit theorem, adding up random numbers, is that at any given time is a net random velocity associated with all of these electrons inside of this resistor. And because these electrons have a charge, there's a net motion of charge in this resistor, which implies that there is a net current. And so here is our I that we were missing in Ohm's law. So to illustrate this concept, I've cooked up a little simulation here where the black box on the left is supposed to be our resistor with these blue electrons bouncing around inside of it. And on the right side, I've summed up all of the velocities of these electrons along with the charge that they're each carrying to get the current at any given time. And you can see this plot is changing versus time as we kind of walk through time in our simulation. And then it wraps around once it gets to the end. And each time a collision occurs, either with the side of the resistor or within the electrons themselves, you'll see a, a change in the velocities and therefore a change in the current as a function of time. So at any given moment, the sum of the random velocities of these electrons ends up with some current. And as interactions happen with these electrons, that random current moves around. That current is not equal to zero. Although if you did average over a long amount of time, you'll see that it kind of is centered around zero and could average to zero in the long term. Now we'll come back to these simulations in a moment, but I just wanted to show you that there is in fact a net current at any given moment, and that sets up a voltage. Now what we'd like to know is exactly what is the voltage that we could expect out of a resistor. So to do that, we need to come up with an expression for what we might expect the current through this resistor to be on average. Now current I is the charge per time that makes it through this resistor. So we could estimate the current as the charge of each electron, which is minus E, times the typical velocity of an electron, V, divided by the amount of time it takes for an electron traveling at that velocity 
to get across this resistor. So we'll define a length of this resistor to be L here. And while we're at it, we'll define the cross-sectional area of this resistor to be A, so that the total volume of this resistor is A times L. So we divide this by L so that we now have units of charge times, and this was distance per time, so centimeters per second, divided by the centimeters. So now we have charge per time. But this was just for a single electron. So now we need to add up all the electrons inside of this resistor, and we know that the total random velocity associated with that should grow as the square root of the number of electrons. So we'll do the square root of the number of electrons. And rather than just make up a number for these, I'm going to make up a density of electrons, n. So n is going to be the number of electrons per volume. And then we'll multiply that by the volume of this resistor, which is A times L. And we can plug in our velocity that we calculated from our temperature over here. And to avoid having to draw these square roots, I'm going to square the I over here. So I squared is of order E squared over L squared times 2KT over M times N times A times L. So now I'm going to use the expression P equals IV, which is that the power is given by the product of the current times the voltage. And I'll also use Ohm's law that says V is equal to I times R to say that P is equal to I squared R. So we have our I squared over here. We just need to multiply by R. So our power is of order this expression we had for I squared times R. I've used one of these L's to cancel out the L squared times the resistance. Now instead of just writing R here, I'm going to use an interesting expression for R, which is that it is the length of this resistor over the area of this resistor times the conductance of this material. Now this expression kind of makes sense because we know that if we put resistors in series, their resistances should add. So as we add length to a single resistor, we're essentially adding resistors onto the end of this column. So resistance should grow with L linearly. And as we add more cross-sectional area to our resistor, that's kind of like adding resistors in parallel, which means we should be lowering the resistance of our resistor. So it makes sense that the cross-sectional area is in the denominator here. And the last question is, what is this conductance? Well, it turns out this conductance is defined to be the number density of electrons times the square of the charge of those times a time constant for collisions that happen within this resistor. And that'll become important later, that time constant, divided by the mass of the charge carriers, which is just the mass of the electron. So if we plug this in to our expression for power, something really cool happens. So we put in an L over A for our resistance here, and then I'm going to flip the conductance upside down as I multiply it here. M over N E squared, and then that mysterious collision time scale. And the cool thing that happens is our E squared cancels with our E squared, our mass cancels with our mass, our number density of electrons cancels out, so it doesn't depend on that. The length of our resistor cancels out, the cross-sectional area of our resistor cancels out. And so what we're left with is that this power is of order 2 kT over the collision time scale. And kT is an energy, and time scale t is a time. So this is energy per time. That's the units of power. So that kind of makes sense here. So that's really interesting. That says that the power we get from the random fluctuations in the current in this resistor that just come from the thermal motion of the electrons doesn't depend on the resistor at all. It doesn't depend on the value of the resistance. It doesn't depend on the size of the resistor. All it depends upon is the temperature of that resistor and the collision time scale of these electrons inside the resistor. And in fact, we can compare two simulations of the random current that arises from electrons moving. In the top simulation, we have a bunch of electrons that are very dense and therefore collide way more often along with the random fluctuation in current that we measure in that simulation, compared with the bottom simulation where you have fewer collisions between these electrons because it's less dense. And you can see in the plot of the current as a function of time that there's way more structure in the current that comes from the dense electron case where there are a lot of collisions. These collisions happen so frequently that there's a whole bunch of time structure that gets imposed on that current. And you'll also see that the overall magnitude of that current has increased. 
So what does this mean for our expression for Johnson Nyquist noise? Well, it means two things. First of all, for the density and thermal motion of electrons in a resistor, there's going to be a time scale, a minimum time scale for collision. That if you look at power that comes from variations on shorter and shorter time scales, eventually there will be a time scale of order the collision time between electrons, below which there just aren't fluctuations. So if we took the Fourier transform of the voltage or the current that's flowing in this resistor, this means that there's a high frequency cutoff to Johnson Nyquist noise. And in practice, for kind of room temperature electronics, this is like 50 or 60 gigahertz, where we stop getting noise fluctuations because of this minimum time scale. Now the other consequence of this is that if we are below the high frequency cutoff, then because this is just random white noise, coming from random thermal variations. The power is a function of frequency. I'm using nu here to describe frequency. It's about flat. That means if I were to graph the spectral density or power as a function of frequency from Johnson noise, we get something that's nearly flat out until when it starts cutting off at around 50 gigahertz. But in practice, we rarely have systems that go all the way to 50 gigahertz. We've usually, whether it's because we have RC filters or some other filter in our system, we usually have a cutoff in our own system of electronics. So if we call that cutoff to have some bandwidth B, then the amount of power we'll actually receive is the product of the amplitude of this spectral power density times the bandwidth. And if you work that out, then our power as a function of time is of order KTB, where now B, the bandwidth, has taken the place of this collision time scale tau over c, but they have the same units. This has units of 1 over time, and this had units of 1 over time. So this is the main result of Johnson Nyquist noise, is that there is a power that's injected into your system that's proportional to temperature and proportional to the bandwidth of your system. And if we want to bring that back to the voltage that we started with, using that power, which is IV, is also equal to, using Ohm's law, V squared over R, then V squared equals KTB times R. So in some ways you can think of a resistor as being some oscillating noise signal with these characteristics that then sends a signal out through an ideal resistor of resistance R which does not have any Johnson noise associated with it and this injects a signal into anything that you connect this resistor to. So if you connected this to some other resistor downstream and you made a connection here you'd find that the signal from this resistor, the Johnson noise, is injecting power into everything that comes downstream, including this resistor. And there's a theorem that says that if you want to transmit power down through a system, if the maximum power transfer happens when you have a, a matched system, such that you're dissipating the power into a resistor of the same resistance as the impedance of the source. And the only reason I say this is because, in practice, how much of this power from our Johnson noise actually propagates down through the system? Well, the maximum amount that it could be is in this well-matched system where you can see that the voltage drops by half as it goes across because we're measuring the voltage drop over a resistor R that's part of a voltage divider that had 2R total resistance. So that implies that the actual voltage that we'll ever measure here when we connect it to anything downstream including your scope will only be that inherent Johnson Nyquist noise signal divided by 2. So for V squared you'll often see the equation for Johnson noise written as V squared equals 4 KTBR where that 4 just comes from the power transfer through the system. And one last little thing, you may have noticed that I dropped the, the 2 in front of our 2KT that came from our setting the kinetic energy of the electron to the kinetic temperature. And I actually dropped that 2 on purpose. We were doing kind of an order of magnitude derivation. If you did it in detail, taking into account the fact that not all of the velocity is oriented along the length of the resistor, you'll find that that factor of 2 drops out there. So this equation down here is the full equation for Johnson noise. And the last thing I wanted to point out is that if you want to reduce the noise injected into a system, if you really care about the amount of noise in your system, you only have a few choices for what you can do. You can either try to lower the temperature of your resistors, so you can try to cool your system, 
And this is why you'll see for low noise amplifier systems that are really low noise, they'll have some cryogenic cooling or something that keeps the temperature of their system down. Or you can try to reduce the bandwidth of the signal injected into your system. So you can try filtering. And those are about your only options. You might be tempted to say, oh, look, I can reduce my resistance. And that will lower your voltage square, but it won't lower the power. Because as you see, the power injected into any downstream system does not depend on the resistance. So there you have it. Johnson noise, or sometimes called Johnson Nyquist noise, is a source of noise for most electronic systems. And the only way to decrease it is either to filter or to lower the temperature of your electronics.